Hello everyone. As part of our Better Outcomes webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Who Let the Bugs Out? Keeping Patients Safe from Medical Devices and the Healthcare Environment. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Caffrey, who is our moderator today. Lisa is an Infection Prevention Coordinator at Genesis Health System in Davenport, Iowa. She is also an Infection Control District Consultant for the Iowa Department of Public Health and the Iowa Department of Public Health Statewide Steering Committee. Lisa has been a member of the APIC Professional Development Council since 2013 and began the role of co-chair in 2016. She served as chapter reviewer for the revision of the APIC text and is a contributing author to the certification study guide. In 2012, she received the Dorothy A. Raisley Iowa Infection Control Practitioner of the Year Award. And in 2016, she was recognized in APIC's first class of fellows. Lisa, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon your location today, and thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Who Let the Bugs Out? Keeping Patients Safe from Medical Devices in the Healthcare Environment. And speaking to us today on this very timely talk is Ms. <coughs> Libby Chinnis. Ms. Chinnis is an infection prevention and control consultant with over 30 years experience in all healthcare settings. She has had her own consulting company, Infection IC Solutions, LLC, for 15 years. She has authored a, a, co-authored a chapter on meeting infection prevention challenges in ambulatory care settings in the APIC Joint Commission Resources JCR Workbook, 3rd Edition, 2017. Ms. Chinnis has published several books on infection prevention programs, numerous articles, and lectured extensively throughout the country to APIC ARN, state ambulatory surgery societies, nursing home associations, and numerous others. She has served the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, APIC, in many capacities at the state and national levels. She is a frequent faculty member in APIC courses, as well as served as extended <coughs> faculty for AHRQ's safety program for ambulatory surgery. Today's continuing education um, hours are up available. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. The providers are listed below. To obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar, and support for this educational activity is provided by Philips Healthcare. Uh, speaker disclosures today are uh, Libby serves as a consultant for 3M and um, on A8. HRQ, HRET, Extended Faculty National Safety Program for Ambulatory Surgery. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Libby to begin her presentation. Well, thank you, Lisa, very much. And I'd like to thank SACS Healthcare Communication and also Phillips Healthcare for supporting our webinar today. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you all for taking out time from your day to be with us. And I hope this will be useful to you. Um, Let's just briefly go over our objectives for today. We're going to discuss three reasons why medical devices have been linked to infections and outbreaks, how contamination of the environment can also lead to those infections, and we're going to recall measures to prevent infections associated with devices and the environment. Well. Microbes are everywhere, and these microbes can cause infections, which can lead to much morbidity or disease and even be deadly. A major, uh, they are a major risk for procedures 
with the introduction of infection. So failure to properly disinfect and sterilize equipment carries not only the risk associated with the breach of the host barriers, but also the additional risk of person-to-person -person transmission, for example, with hepatitis B infection, and transmission of pathogens that can contaminate the environment, like C. difficile. Transmission of pathogens within the healthcare environment remains a hazard to patients, but how do these microorganisms get to our most vulnerable patients? We like to describe this as the epidemiological triangle, and this triangle is made up of three corners that you see here. You have to have all three factors for disease or infection to occur. And the first one is the pathogen, or the disease producer. And this is the agent, like a bacteria, or a virus, or a fungus. Next, you have to have that patient, or the host, in our case, the susceptible patient. And then thirdly, you have to have an environment in which the bug lives, and the, the patient um, is there also, and a mode of transmission for the pathogen to get to the host. So it's really the interplay between all three of these factors, and any one a change in one affects all three. If we, we can take an example of any infectious disease, for example, mumps is making a comeback in some states like Iowa and Illinois, and mumps is spread by the droplet uh, form of transmission. Um, particularly in a crowded environment. Um, many of the students on university settings may not have been vaccinated or vaccinated appropriately with uh, two doses of the mumps vaccine. So if we look at this disease specifically, if we were to get rid of the agent, the mumps virus, then we could not have the disease occurring. Or if our host was not susceptible and properly vaccinated and the vaccine worked, we could not have mumps happening to that host. Um, another example, perhaps with C. diff, would be if there's environmental contamination, then the agent could be transmitted and infection could spread. So this is a way we uh, look to explain how disease is spread. There, there's more and more evidence in our scientific literature that contaminated inanimate surfaces, especially the ones we touch by hand, can help spread pathogens. And this can either be directly, for example, the patient touching the contaminated subject uh, surface himself, or indirectly through uh, to the patient from the hands of the healthcare worker, which probably touched the contaminated surface, and then the patient. So each year in our country, there are 46 million procedures, according to Centers for Disease Control, that are performed on hospitalized patients, and an estimated 53 million surgical and non-surgical procedures uh, procedures during ambulatory surgery visits. Overall, out of these, there's an estimated 1.7 million healthcare-associated infections. And notice I said healthcare, not just hospital-associated. These are every year in our country, and they cost over $30 billion. As this slide shows, this amounts to about one in every 25 hospitalized patients um, coming down with a healthcare associated infection. And this leads to more patient illness, deaths, and of course, cost of health care. The healthcare associated infections are a complication of healthcare and linked with high morbidity and mortality. But in addition to this one in 25 hospitalized patients that are diagnosed with at least one infection related to healthcare alone, there are additional infections in other settings like long-term care and ambulatory and home care. Many of these infections are caused by the most urgent and serious resistant 
uh, bacteria to antibiotics and they may lead to sepsis or death and of course they lead to human and financial cost also. So I have a question for all of you out there. Which of the 1 in 25 patients would you be willing to risk? Your spouse, your partner, perhaps your child or a parent or friend? And I think we know the answer to that is we don't want to risk any of these patients. So what about the vehicles? How is this transmitted? Um, how are the organisms transmitted? Um, the healthcare workers' hands is one mode, by portable multi-use equipment, another mode, and by healthcare environmental surfaces, the third mode. And of these three, the most common by far are the hands, and yet our compliance of healthcare workers with hand hygiene is less than 50% in some of the articles noted on the slide. When we're talking about portable multi-use equipment, we could mean things like pagers and phones and tablets, as well as otoscopes and tourniquets and other devices. The article listed by Hahn below gave a systemic review of the systematic review of the literature and found that stethoscopes, digital devices, white coats and neckties were commonly contaminated with pathogens or disease producers like Staph aureus, MRSA and gram negative rods, but there is a lot of variability in the literature. As we said, hand hygiene is the simplest and the most effective way to prevent infections from spreading. But complications by healthcare workers, but compliance by healthcare workers is not where we would like it to be. The contamination of hands was highly associated with high-risk contact. So examples of that, high-risk contact could be exposure to fecal soiling or contact without the use of gloves in this study. Nursing assistants, therefore, that had contact with fecal soiling most frequently were the ones that were most frequently contaminated with high-risk exposures. And Appropriate use of gloves can prevent the transmission of C. diff. So as we've stated, there are numerous studies that have implicate, implicated frequently touched medical devices and surfaces in healthcare to be contaminated with pathogens as well as non-pathogens. The healthcare worker picks up the organisms on their hands from the equipment or surfaces and then passes them on to patients. This can lead to not only infections but also outbreaks. Outbreak investigation and control is very disruptive. If any of you have ever had an outbreak going on in your facility or ICU or OR, you know this is very disruptive to patient care as well as time consuming and expensive and it can result in a lot of bad publicity for the facility as well as lawsuits. Even in the long run, it can result in patient lookbacks where we're notifying hundreds or thousands of patients that were possibly exposed. So Emily, I believe we're ready to launch our first polling question and I would ask you as the audience to go ahead and be um, doing your polling while Emily is explaining. That's right, Libby, and I've just launched the poll and what we'd like you to do is answer all that apply. What pathogens have been linked to contaminated services and equipment? Okay, here we go. I'm going to go ahead now and close the poll and share those results. So, Miss Libby, what do you make of these answers? Well, it looks like most folks think that C. diff can contaminate surfaces and be linked to infection, and they're correct, as well as MRSA and VRE, but actually all of these, we should check all of these. Acinetobacter has even been linked with outbreaks with respiratory equipment and devices and ventilators, and so these are all frequent causes of healthcare-associated infections.
Well, I'd like to thank everyone for voting in this poll. We'll have a couple more polls coming up. And Libby, thank you for facilitating that. And let's go on with our show. Okay. Well, when we think of the sheer number of procedures, even in a procedure like endoscopy and how many of those procedures are done nationwide, um, we can really get an inkling of the number of pathogens that that are out there that could contaminate equipment and devices to cause infections. And I'd ask you to think about surfaces that could be contaminated as two types if we drew a line down the center of the slide. There are housekeeping surfaces like the furniture in the room, the bed rails, the bedside table, walls and floors, and there are also surfaces of our medical equipment like the outside of the ventilator, IV poles, computers and phones. Often multi-use equipment, and I have many examples of that, blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes, glucometers, computers on wheels, outside of ventilators, keyboards, and even wheelchairs. They're touched hundreds of times a day by patients, visitors, and staff. So why do we want to focus on these surfaces? Well, we can look at all of the surfaces to clean and disinfect, and this includes the nooks and crannies. And so one hint is that these, the cleaning has to be assigned, and we really should keep the disinfectant and supplies with movable equipment so that it's ready, readily accessible. When we speak of multi-use equipment, the cleaning practices for this equipment is poor, and not only among housekeepers, but among nurses and respiratory therapists, all types of healthcare workers, and all types of equipment. In fact, in the study quoted on the slide, equipment was wiped when folks were monitoring out of 110 times, the equipment in the room was only wiped 15 times. That's sort of unbelievable, 13% of the time um, before patient use or after patient use, and only 23% of the time, so just a little bit more, when the patient was on contact precautions or isolation. So our personnel, all of us, are falling down on the job with taking a chance to protect our patients from environmental and equipment surfaces, and this can definitely contribute to infections. So with that, let's launch another, our number two polling question, question Emily. Okay, and thank you so much. I'm launching it right now. The major mode of transmission of healthcare-associated pathogens to patients is via what? Please select one answer and submit it, and we will see how our audience voted in just a few moments. Okay, it's good. I can close the poll now, and let's go ahead and share those results. Libby, what do you make of these answers? Okay, now I expected more of you all out there to know this. The majority are right, 59%, but what I want you to know all of these things can be involved with transmitting infections to patients, but it is our hands that are the most important part. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens in a few moments. Okay. In addition to hands, we said there's an, an increasing evidence for the role of the environment in terms of surfaces not being cleaned properly. In fact, one study I found in the literature in the Journal of AORN Nursing um, was that even in the operating rooms, there was only a mean rate of 25% of the items in that room being cleaned. So if you're the next patient having surgery, only one in four of those items in the room have been cleaned. That's a scary thought. And additionally, there's a good bit of literature showing now that there's greater risk of infection with multidrug resistant organisms and C. difficile 
in rooms that house patients that previously had these. So the cleaning has to be very detailed and thorough and we have to get to all surfaces and make sure we've done it appropriately. High touch non-critical hospital surfaces like bed rails, overbed tables, and IV poles are contaminated with pathogens or disease producers, and many have been linked to outbreaks in hospitals and long-term care especially. In the first study by Shams et al. below, the multidrug resistant organisms were recovered from 40% of the clean rooms, the rooms that were already cleaned. In fact, 34% were from the rooms that had been routinely clean and 17% from the terminally clean where we do the additional more thorough cleaning at the end of the day and we still didn't get everything. So we can see our hands and surfaces are, are contaminated and can, sort, can be a source of infection to our patients. Well, in 2008, the Centers for Disease Control, as you'll see on the reference at the bottom of the slide, came out with their guidelines for disinfection and sterilization. And they noted in those guidelines, because it was unnecessary to sterilize everything used on a patient, healthcare policies must identify what process is needed, whether it's cleaning, disinfection or sterilization based mainly on how that item is used. And so years ago we were fortunate enough to have somebody smart enough to figure this out on a practical basis and that was a Dr. Earl Spaulding. And the OR and infection prevention know of Dr. Spaulding even to this day because he developed this system below for classifying medical instruments and equipment. In other words, Dr. Spaulding taught us how to use this to say, is the item not of much significance for transferring infectious diseases, or could it be of extreme significance? So let's go over those. A critical item is a high-risk item. It enters sterile tissue or the bloodstream, and because it does, it therefore needs to be sterilized and not just wiped off or disinfected. At the other end of the spectrum are the non-critical items, and these only touch intact skin, so they would never be used on a patient's mucous membrane or on open, broken skin, and they only need low-level disinfection. And then in the middle are the devices called semi-critical that come into contact with intact mucous membranes like our throat or mouth or our rectum. Um, and these need high-level disinfection. They could even contact uh, skin that's not intact like um, psoriasis or be the item be used near a uh, surgical uh, incision. So let's give some examples of these. Critical items that are the highest risk must be sterile because of their high risk of becoming contaminated. And that would be examples like surgical instruments and catheters used in the bloodstream or vascular catheters. Now, our middle items, semi-critical items, that come into contact with, mu with mucous membranes or non-intact skin would be things like laryngoscope blades, um, certain types of scopes, and these have long been associated with transmission of organisms and development of infections. Many of these semi-critical items are hard to clean and disinfect, and they're easily damaged, like some of our scopes. And here's just a short list of some of the semi-critical items that we can deal with every day. Laryngoscope blades, bronchoscopes, as well as GI endoscopes that are touching those mucous membranes, respiratory therapy and anesthesia equipment, endocavitary probes, tonometers, and vaginal specula. And one item that I didn't note there was 
ultrasound transducers. Now, as you all know, some of those can be inserted into an opening in the body like the vagina or rectum. And so depending on their use, if they're put into a body cavity, they can readily transmit organisms. And so um, these would be considered semi-critical um, items for disinfection. Vaginal probes can actually transmit HPV or human papillomavirus and hepatitis B and we should not use the probe with just the cover alone and no high-level disinfection. It requires both. So these semi-critical items are not critical. They don't need to be free of all organisms like sterile items, but they should be free of all microorganisms with the exception of small numbers of bacterial spores. And so with our semi-critical items, first we have to do cleaning. We cannot disinfect or sterilize any item unless it has been cleaned first. It just won't work. So between uses, we do what's called a pre-cleaning. So let's take, for existence, for uh, instance, um, our endoscopes. If, as we do the scope on the patient in the procedure room and we take the scope out of the rectum, um, we do what's called a pre-cleaning immediately at the bedside, and that means the person handling the scope would wipe the outside of the scope off and would flush the inside of the scope before it's actually enclosed in a container labeled biohazard and taken to actually be um, either manually or mechanically clean. So the pre-cleaning first, then the manual cleaning, and then the next step would either be high-level disinfection or sterilization, either one. You can always go higher, just not lower on the ladder for semi-critical items. Don't forget, a critical thing now being looked at by surveyors are the manufacturer's instructions for use, and they are very specific for each piece of equipment or each model of scope that's being used. These need to be posted in the area where the scopes are being reprocessed, or they need to be in books right where the reprocessors um, can get to them to go over the steps, because we need to follow those steps as listed. This is the way the company validates by giving us the actual steps, one, two, three, four, to however many steps, um, and we must follow those steps. There can't be any um, loose ends or uh, cutting of corners here. All of our folks have to be trained on how to do the, the high-level disinfection of these semi-critical devices, and not only do they need to take a course on this or listen to a lecture, they need to be checked off on demonstration of actually doing the procedure per the IFU. So they need to be deemed competent by a person who's also competent. There also needs to be oversight. So we need to have folks that are competent in these procedures to be in and out of these areas looking at how these devices are being handled and making sure that folks are handling them properly by auditing them. Now, last but not least are the non-critical devices at the bottom of the totem pole, and they really touch intact skin, like a pair of crutches or um, a stethoscope or a um, pulse oximeter or even EKG leads. And these may not pose as much risk of infection because they're not touching um, skin that's not intact and they're not touching mucous membrane, but they can act as a reservoir of infection simply from their surface. So we can see a whole list here. Not everything is listed, but another example would be um, oxygen face masks that I would think most people would be using disposables on those. But these are examples of non-critical, and there are many more. And remember we just said some ultrasound transducers 
were considered semi-critical because they went in the vaginal or the rectal uh, area. Well, there's some that don't enter a body cavity and they just touch the skin. So abdominal ultrasounds would also be considered a non-critical device because they're passed over the surface of the body and not inserted inside the body. So these non-critical items would then be clean first, just as the semi-critical and critical, and we would use an EPA-registered disinfectant to disinfect them with. Um, I think that brings us to our third polling question, Emily. And I'm launching the poll, and I welcome folks to select one of the following, which is most likely to transmit a healthcare associated infection if it's not properly cleaned and disinfected between patients. Let us know what you think. And we are going to go ahead now and close the poll and I am going to share the results with you. Miss Libby, what do you think? Very good, very good. Correct answer, 75% of you chose the laryngoscope blade. And why? Because it is a higher risk of transmitting due to it being a semi-critical item. It touches mucous membranes. Um, the rest of the items, the pulse oximeter, the stethoscope and blood pressure cuff, are all non-critical, which touch intact skin and no mucous membrane contact. So thank you, Emily. You're so welcome. All right, well let's get back to how do we link, what is the link between all of these devices, and we're focusing on semi-critical and non-critical today, and infections. What causes infections in patients from these devices? As we said, we do so many procedures to patients now, and many of these involve semi-critical and non-critical devices. One that has been in the literature a lot almost every month are the blood glucose meters or glucometers that can actually become microscopically contaminated where we can't see it with blood droplets. And if they're not cleaned and disinfected between patients, they can pass this on uh, hepatitis B and C to other patients without proper cleaning and disinfection. So we have to look at the instructions for use. Many outbreaks have been due to use of glucometers. Um, another linkage could be whether we're using reusable equipment versus single-use, one-time disposable equipment. Um, so let's look at some of these reasons. The design itself of the instrument. Look at just simply the forceps alone. The forceps have to be open like a pair of scissors. If we don't get inside when the surgeon does open the forceps, um, then a piece of blood or a piece of tissue that's left in there would not have been cleaned and, and disinfected or sterilized, and this could fall into the surgical wound. So with hinged instruments and instruments with lots of parts, they have to be opened and taken apart and dissembled. And um, another one that causes many, many issues today is that of our scopes because of the many lumens and channels that we find that are so hard to uh, clean and disinfect and sterilize. In fact, the design um, is not only a problem with many of the scopes, but they're easily damaged too, so we have to really handle them with great care. And you may have seen in the literature over the last few years that with our duodena scopes that we use to enter the bowel, um, the elevator at the very distal end of the scope, it's the little toggle switch there you see on the right that we can press up and down. It's very hard to clean and clean around, and there's reports of many organisms, including uh, CRE, or carbapenem-resistant enterobacteria C, that's a mouthful, uh, that's been transmitted to patients as well as other pathogens from this, um, the design of the scope and the difficulty of the design and the cleaning of the scope. 
One that I'll just mention briefly because it's been in the news a lot lately is the are the heater cooler devices used during open heart surgery. And these have mainly been linked to one manufacturer, but these are used during open chest surgeries to warm or cool patients. And there's a potential for a cousin of tuberculosis that's called a non-tuberculous mycobacterium. That's the name of the bug. That grows in the water tank in the heater cooler units and operating room. And it's noted that the, the tank was not designed, the water was not designed to come into contact with the patient's blood or body fluids, but they found that contaminated water droplets from the tank could transmit bacteria through the air. So it was being aerosolized from the heater cooler units into the OR environment and then into the chest cavity or onto the implant of the open heart. Uh, patient. So very, very serious infections caused from infections on devices. And I've given you many references there. In addition to the device itself, as we said, the device could be reusable or single use. And if we're looking at reusable versus single use, um, two very good examples could be that of EKG leads and also pulse oximetry sensors. And let's look at this. You know, some of you may use some of each or only one of the other having done a cost analysis. And so at this point, we've got a decision to make. Do we use a reusable or do we use a disposable? Well, if we use a reusable EKG lead or pulse oximeter, they may become contaminated during use. Um, and so um, the risk does increase if it's used near an incision or a wound or the skin's not intact. And we have to know who is responsible to clean and disinfect this item between patients. Um, and some cannot be immersed underwater either. If we think about single-use disposable, we get rid of our reservoir because we're getting rid of the equipment in between patients. Um, and we can consider this if we know we're going to use it near wounds or non-intact skin. And it is recommended that we use a single use on patients on isolation. And you see several resources listed there. But looking at this decision, we also, with both, have to consider the cost of reprocessing. Um, now, with single use, there may be a higher cost, including the cost of the waste stream. But we could decrease the infection rate and therefore the cost associated with infection. The item might be used once and discarded. And some docs would also say, is the item acceptable if it's disposable? Maybe they don't like the um, disposable item as well as they did the reusable. But again, with the reusable, are the staff compliant with cleaning and disinfecting? Because if they aren't, we could add a lot more labor by redoing these processes all over again. So the third reason that this has been linked with bugs and devices is that we don't follow the reprocessing guidelines. So many outbreaks have been linked to noncompliance, mostly with adherence to proper cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, and even rinsing, drying, and storing the item. We need to have the most current instructions for use at the place. Sometimes I visit facilities and the decontam area will have um, instructions from 1960. And we know in most instances those are not the most current. And these change often. So stay in touch with your manufacturers. We need to do the point of use cleaning. We need to also monitor after we clean it. Have these actually been cleaned? 
team, and we'll talk about that in a minute, as well as training and making sure our folks are competent and supervising them and letting them know that we're auditing them and we're feeding back what we're finding on the audit. And I like to say this to my hubby, because if the egg on the frying pan is not clean, then it ain't going to be disinfected or sterilized. We have to get that off before those processes can work. So if we're looking inside of a scope, how do we know that that scope is cleaned? Maybe we've, we've cleaned it several times. Visualization alone won't work anymore. It's good and we can use lights and magnifications and we should have that. But people are now actually taking small scopes called boroscopes and they're going inside the regular scopes to see if they see anything. And many of these scopes that have already been cleaned for use are are showing visible debris and damage. And this is occurring in more and more literature that's out there. There are um, products out there now which can be used to monitor cleaning as well as the cleaning of the environment called ATP as well as some strips that we can use to monitor hemoglobin, protein, and even carbohydrates. And some folks are even culturing their scopes. However we monitor the cleaning, we want to feed that back to the people that are reprocessing. And a good way to do this is by checklists and logs. Because my goodness, look at the settings that we're working in. Look at this equipment. Look at these settings. How many surfaces and pieces of equipment we have to clean. Is it any wonder that organisms live on the items? Many of the multidrug resistant um, organisms contaminate surfaces and live on the items for weeks and even months. So we have to inspect visually and we have to use other markers like ATP and even things called fluorescent markers to see if housekeeping has cleaned the environment. So if we go briefly to the end of our webinar, we know that hand hygiene must happen. Um, compliance with hand hygiene and appropriate glove use will prevent infections from happening. And even though our rates are still low, we can do everything we can to try to increase this because it is the single most effective means to um, prevent infectious diseases from spreading. We need to have have written policies and procedures that say who does hand hygiene, when they do it, how often, how many sick seconds, when should they do uh, soap and water, when should they do alcohol, and do they have accessibility to all of these products. You know, alcohol is the gold standard that we should be using routinely, but soap and water, if, we, if our hands are visibly contaminated with blood or we have a patient, for instance, with C. diff. Other ways of prevention, actually in all setting, assign in all settings, assign responsibility for who's going to do the cleaning and disinfection and to actually follow those IFUs and policies. Don't rush the staff. And the OR recently visited staff were being rushed to do environmental cleaning to let another patient in before the room had been cleaned from the last patient. So folks have to have time, they have to have accessibility, and sometimes they even have to have disposable items, for example, on isolation to help them get their jobs done. There needs to be a system that um, there's a schedule, people are responsible for cleaning, and it's enforced. And we need to do audits and ongoing observations with checklists that feed the information back. We can educate, but we have to re-educate people. We have to talk about this over and over and inspect and give feedback as to why folks should be doing these things. And in the end, highly reliable organizations follow all of these modes of prevention that you see on the slide. Education of all shifts, proving competency, 
doing constant rounds, looking at the quality of care, doing small quality improvement studies, and hardwiring these behaviors to make it our common practice and not the exception to the rule. And when we do these things, we're following everything we know to do to keep patients safe from medical devices and our healthcare environment. And with that, I'd like to end our webinar and open it up for questions. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Libby, for such a great presentation on an important topic. A reminder, this program is um, approved for 1.0 contact hours. To obtain C your CEU for this activity, go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash BO. You will, be able to re you will need to register at that site. Complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. And again, these are the providers for the program. And now, I'd like to open it up to the questions. So, Libby, are you ready to start with questions? Ready on this end. Okay, here we go. Uh, a participant from Canada is wanting to know how U.S. Uh, specialists are able to give, convince their hospitals to go with single-use items before an issue appears. So how do you get your hospitals to do that? Um, I think that he's exactly right. Sometimes um, we're in the middle of a problem before we realize maybe we should take a look. Could disposables help us in some instances? And they may not work everywhere, but we have to actually do our homework. And I think this is where the infection preventionist can help nursing and respiratory to look at for the facility, um, uh, help doing a cost analysis to actually cost it out. Because sometimes the labor of washing all of these instruments and cleaning and disinfecting them is actually more than just buying the disposable item to begin with. But we do have to cost it out. Each item is different. Yeah, I agree. I would also include it as part of a risk assessment, maybe, um, as part of that cost analysis as well. So exactly. that's, how I've, that's how I've accomplished it. Uh, there are a number of questions, Libby, about disinfectants, so I'll try to get through as many of those as I can. Are all disinfectants equally effective? No. Every disinfectant is not the same. Um, some kill some organisms and some kill others. You want to mainly look, if it's a low level, um, on the product label for an EPA registration number. A little number will be right on the label of the product and you want to know that it's approved on the label as a hospital-approved disinfectant. Some may be tuberculocidal, which kills other organisms from some that are not listed as tuberculocidal. And then we have our high-level disinfectants um, that are things like glutaraldehyde and OPA, not to specifically name products, but to give you an example, um, that are totally different and used for disinfection of semi-critical items. So all of those are different. They cannot be mixed. They can't be substituted. Purchasing cannot order um, one low level in place of another without going through products and infection control committee. And they all have their pluses and minuses. Okay. Great answer. Our next question is from Susan, and she wanted to know if there's any place for essential oils in cleaning uh, non-critical devices. Um, I'm not sure what that question exactly is asking. Are, are, are you asking Susan about lubricating the instruments? Well, she says there are several... Um, essential oils that are good for cleaning surfaces, but can, can they be used in the healthcare setting? And oh, I think you okay. answered that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you need to look at manufacturer's instructions, uh, not only for the product, but what item you're cleaning. Is it a countertop or is it a scope that's going into the body? And you, the 
item itself will give you instructions for what can and can't be used on it and what may damage it or make its use invalid. Um, I would not I would say using oils routinely on any surface. I would not agree with that. If an instrument is to be lubricated, the manufacturer of the instrument would tell you at what step and how to do that and their instructions for use. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Dawn. Um, she would like to know, would a probe used to insert central lines be considered a semi-critical item since skin integrity is broken? Very good question. Until recently, Dawn, I had never considered that uh, question. And recently in teaching with some of my other APIC colleagues, we have come to realize if, if you're using a probe that close to where the skin is broken or punctured, then we need to have a sterile um, item or high level disinfected at least, not just uh, wiped off. Very good question. So if the probe is used on or near, um, an incision or an open skin, then we should be doing high-level disinfection as per manufacturer's instructions for use. Thank you. You can always go higher. If, if um, sterilization is allowed and you're high-level disinfecting and want to sterilize, you can, um, but you can't go lower. You can't go to a low-level disinfection like a uh, uh, disinfectant wipe. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question is from Tisha. In regards to ventilators and BiPAPs, is it against infection control studies to completely set up circuits? Maybe you mean pre-setting up, having them kind of set up and ready to go. Maybe it's what she's getting at. Um, I'll ask Lisa her opinion on this too, working with a big system, but um, I know that recently I looked at um, the anesthesia guidelines by the um, physicians themselves, and they do address that, that some of that can be set up, I believe it was 48 hours ahead of time. I'm not a proponent of that. I don't like to walk into the operating room and find the ventilator set up with tubing opened and in a pack and it's been tested and pushed back down in the pack. Um, I think there's plenty of time to do that when the patient enters the OR, but I'll, I'll ask Lisa her opinion on that also. No, I agree. In our facility, we discourage any pre-setting up of anything. Um, there's plenty of time when the patient, when you know the patient's arriving or um, before you need it to set stuff up. So we don't really encourage that practice at all. One thing that bothers me a lot, um, Lisa, when we talk about, you know, how many surfaces can be contaminated and healthcare workers contaminated, think if some of that tubing is on anesthesia or respiratory uh, card or the ventilator and it's put back in the bag but open and housekeeping comes in to clean that room between patients or the respiratory therapist comes in to clean the ventilator and handles that and they have just handled a dirty item and they, did, they didn't use good hand hygiene. Now we've contaminated the new open piece of equipment that would be used on the next patient. So that's, that's really why, the background why we're saying we don't like that practice. Yeah, oh, I absolutely agree with you. You, just, you can't, it's not under your observation so you can't be sure. Exactly. So great. Um, I saw... I thought I saw one on CPAPs. What do you think of allowing a patient to bring their CPAP um, from home? Bringing in, I think this goes beyond CPAPs, bringing in medical equipment from home. Um, I know that I have been asked that before not too long ago, and the facility that I was working with decided not to do that because we don't know the equipment, um, Biomed hasn't checked it out, 
our own facility hasn't maybe cleaned or disinfected it. Um, Lisa? Yeah, our facility does not allow patients to bring in their equipment from home for all the reasons you just cited right there. Staff don't know how to use it, that you can't guarantee the cleanliness of it. It's been infested with bugs, so we just don't allow people to bring their stuff from home. And Lisa and I have not conferred ahead of time, so you're getting two different opinions <laughs> and we're both saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Sandra has a question. This is a great question from Sandra. We didn't mention um, disinfectant contact times, and I find they are problematic when st staff are in a rush. Or rush. Do you have any words of wisdom on yes. those contact times? Um, I will tell you this, that just like anything else, if, if you don't let glue stay on the surface until it dries, then you're not going to be able to glue two surfaces together. If you don't let the item stay wet with the disinfectant wipe for the amount of time or on the other end with high level disinfection for say scopes and it be soaked the proper amount of time, then you have not achieved high level disinfection. For surfaces like in the room, um, um, the easiest thing I think to do is to look on the product label and they all have the contact time. Many are in a circle on the label like three, three minutes or two minutes or one minute. That means that the surface has to stay wet that long. If it's drying before that time, like if it's ten minutes and it's dry at five, you've got to continue wetting the surface so that it's wet the entire ten minutes. So Contact times are very important. They're very different on every product. Staff don't have to memorize what theirs is if they're using different products in different areas, but they need to know where to find that information and follow it because surveyors will be asking uh, the staff and not the infection control person. Great. It looks like we probably have time for one more question, Lee. And so Kara has a question about a question about transvaginal probes. If a transvaginal probe is covered with a condom, should it be considered a semi-critical? Yes. Um, the condom is just like a condom for sex. There could be holes in the product. And so we don't want the microorganisms that are in the vagina, um, particularly if it's something like hep B or human papillomavirus, we don't want those coming through the holes in the condom um, to possibly uh, contaminate the probe and then the next patient that it's used on. So the item is considered semi-critical if it's going into a, a body cavity and the um, condom is just an additional layer. We should still go through the full disinfection of the item as well as cleaning before disinfection. Great. Great. Thanks Libby for your answers. This is, there are a lot of questions. I know we didn't get to all of them today. Um, but thank you for submitting those questions. And this concludes the question and answer portion of our webinar. We have reached the end of our time together. That was an excellent presentation. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Libby, for this very informative session, and as well to you, Lisa, for being our moderator today. It has been such a pleasure working with you both. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.